At number 5, it's subsurface ocean pods on Europa. Europa has recently become geek famous as the most likely place in the solar system to harbor extraterrestrial life. NASA's taking the idea so seriously that they're prepping an unmanned mission that will orbit Jupiter and conduct 45 flybys of the moon to look for telltale signs of life thriving in the salty ocean that's supposed to exist beneath its surface. They hope to get the mission underway sometime in the 2020s, but while it would be exciting to find tiny, bacteriological aliens clustered around geothermal vents deep beneath the surface of the Jovian snowball, one private company doesn't want to wait for robots to do the dirty work, they want to get people there, and they want to do it within the next 50 years. Like Mars One, Objective Europa would be a one-way ticket, but sacrifice is useless unless you learn something along the way, and the project is going to have to leap some major hurdles to keep their astronauts alive long enough to unpack their test tubes. Europa's surface temperatures reach lows of minus 170 degrees Celsius, minus 270 degrees Fahrenheit. It has no atmosphere, at least, no more than a pittance, and nearby Jupiter bombards the moon with a lethal radiation dose of 540 rem on a daily basis. To overcome those problems, Objective Europa wants to keep their team underground. After establishing a short-term surface base, the team would have to drill down through the ice crust to reach the warmer temperatures of the ocean below. There, or somewhere in the connecting ice tunnel, they'd be able to establish an underground base inside permanent air bubbles. Here's a technical schematic. At number 4, it's free-floating O'Neill cylinders. An O'Neill cylinder is a massive tube, 32 km, 20 m, long and 8 km, 5 m, in diameter, that rotates to simulate gravity. Built-in connected, oppositely rotating pairs, each cylinder would, in theory, be able to house 10 million people. Doubt this idea has been around since 1974, ever since physicist Gerard K. O'Neill outlined the concept in an article in Physics Today. Back then, of course, it was an idea firmly entrenched in science fiction. We'd barely been to the moon, so it was unlikely that we'd just turn around and build a cosmic megastructure to house millions of people. However, O'Neill's idea sparked something in the scientific community's collective consciousness, and the concept has refused to die. O'Neill cylinders are still outside our technological grasp, but as so often happens, science is quickly catching up to the fiction. According to the British Interplanetary Society, a group that predicted a practical lunar mission 30 years before the Apollo program, we could actually build an O'Neill cylinder today. The only real problem is getting someone to pay for it. Most of the materials needed to construct the cylinders would be mined from the moon, and the advent of less expensive spacecraft like reaction engines is Skylum. At number 3, it's Vigilo Aerospace's balloon stations. As the single most expensive object ever built and the largest artificial satellite in orbit around Earth, the International Space Station, ICE, is a beacon of human progress that required the cooperation of two dozen nations and over $160 billion in funding. Since 2000, its crews have conducted groundbreaking research in microgravity, cosmic radiation, biotechnology, and dark energy, just to name a few. When Robert Bigelow, a Vegas real estate tycoon, saw the ice in action, he had only one thought, I can do better, so he started Bigelow Aerospace with a $500 million bankroll from his own pocket to research and build commercial space stations for a fraction of the price. While the ice was assembled piece by piece in space over a two-year period, Bigelow's B-330 takes a simpler approach, it's a massive balloon stuffed in the nose cone of a rocket. Once the rocket clears the atmosphere, the balloon inflates into a fully realized space station capable of housing a crew of six. It's a radical idea, but is it crazy? Maybe not. Vigilant already has two inflatable space station modules in orbit, the Genesis I and the Genesis II, and plans are underway to launch the larger space complex Bravo in 2016. And Robert Vigilant isn't stopping with our local neighborhood. His vision for the future of his ballooning business includes lunar colonies, deep space stations, and... At number 2, it's Barbaras. Long before Gerard O'Neill published the first description of his rotating cylinders, NASA scientist Dandridge Cole proposed a similar concept. 
which he called a bubble world, while O'Neill's cylinders were built from scratch using materials scavenged from the moon, Cole's idea was much more metal, firsts, we'd have to find an asteroid made mostly of metal, preferably one of the more malleable alloys like nickel iron, that's easy enough, there are thousands of them all around us, the next step would be to drill a tunnel through the center of the asteroid and fill it with water, and then use concentrated solar heat to fuse the ends of the tunnel closed, dialing back the solar focus, we'd then slowly soften the asteroid's metal body, simultaneously boiling the water inside so that the steam would inflate the asteroid's softened shell and hollow out the interior, after it cooled. Mirrors could reflect sunlight into the hollow interior, spin could be induced to simulate gravity, and people could live on the inside surfer. At number 1, it's bioengineered trees. Imagine an immense tree growing out of a comet, its roots fill the cracks and seams that run through the comet's interior, its canopy forms a protective umbrella around the outside, and its hollow trunk is filled with bustling human colonists. Dart welcome back to the mind of Freeman Dyson. In a 1997 essay for the Atlantic entitled Warm-Blooded Plants and Freeze-Dried Fish, Dyson outlined a plan to use bioengineered greenhouse trees to provide habitats for human colonies in space. The essay reads like a child who dreamed of rocket ships and space flight finally grew up but forgot to stop dreaming. In the paper, he describes the steps required to colonize a meteor with this method. As with most great things, mankind's journey into the cosmos would begin with a seed out once it hit the surface of a comet. According to Dyson, this seed would grow into a huge, warm, bloody plant that would be bioengineered to survive in sub-zero temperatures using only the light from the distant sun there. The tree would grow large enough to form a warm, enclosed habitat filled with oxygen from its natural photosynthesis. By the time humans arrived, their home would already exist within the greenhouse tree. Eli Nixon is the author of Son of Tesla and Nightmare Machines. Follow him on Twitter.